Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News Weekend. Well, after a whirlwind week in Germany, Governor General Mary May Simon and APTN's dynamic duo of reporters have returned to Canada. Tonight we're taking a look back at the trip and its celebratory Canada Night. Both events were brought to life by First Nations, Inuit and Métis representatives from across the country. Here's Lindsay Richardson with that wrap-up. It was a high point of the Governor General's recent state visit to Germany, the Frankfurt Book Fair's Canada Night, in all its colors, where spectators also became performers. The words are Widow Gawe. You can say it back. Widow Gawe. Governor General Mary May Simon knows the importance of nights like these. We have a duty to listen to Indigenous voices and to learn from them. And performers, in turn, recognize the example being set by Simon's historic appointment. I was thrilled. I was absolutely thrilled. It's progress. That's what it feels like. That's what it looks like. Seeing that... that um, representation in all of our different elements is you know, priceless. The state visits rollout was rigorous, a combination of political and cultural outings. There were meetings with Germany's most prominent leaders, roundtables on issues specific to Canada's north, and several museum tours. In a sit-down interview with APTN News, Simon explained it's all about striking a balance. You know, I have to look at it in a way where I'm, my priority is always indigenous issues uh, because I'm indigenous but at the same time I need to remember and I, and, I, and I do that I am representing all Canadians. And while it's one thing to travel across the world and see cultural items on display, it's another thing to do it while feeling culturally supported. That's where these women come in. My name loosely translated into English is Sky Dancer. I'm Cree. Um, my given name is Louise Bernice Half. Louise Bernice Half is the first Indigenous Parliamentary Poet Laureate of Canada and one of the delegates attending as cultural support for Simon. It challenged my core values, like I'm not used to. Uh, um, formal dress, formal behavior, and having to wash my mouth. <laughs> you know? Half spent seven years at Blue Quills Residential School in Alberta. She says parts of the trip and its discussions were painful, but are necessary in the long run. Sometimes my anger and my bitterness is like way up there, right? And at other times I'm okay and calm. And, and if it hadn't been for my personal therapy and going back to um, uh, our uh, spiritual practices, I wouldn't be able to do the work that I do. Uh, and it's just so important to be uh, not only intellectual about it, but to have the emotional breath with it so that you can reach people and educate the public. Uh, but when you have an Inuk Governor General in office, you also have to represent the far north. That's Lisa Koparkwaluk's area of expertise, speaking to issues specific to Nunavik, while also learning from Germany's efforts to reconcile with its own people. We see that um, the experience of the Jews here has been particularly hard, and also, in a sense, um, satisfying, because it's really good to see the efforts that the German society makes to acknowledge uh, the wrongs that had happened in the past. And so it makes me see the possibilities of what can be done to really show and reconcile with past wrongs, uh, just as uh, so much wrongs have happened, had happened in Canada. She says Germans had questions about service gaps in mental health services and education in the Arctic and Simon's northern culture. And we don't want to concentrate on just the terrible things that have happened. We acknowledge them for sure. But we also want to celebrate our culture, who we are, uh, what brought us to where we are today, and what are those incredible um, 
uh, intelligent things that have allowed us to be able to live in an environment that we love. Even half a world away, the goal was to flip the script on indigenous issues, to ground Germany's fascination with First Nations with facts, while making it clear past pain won't hinder future progress. Tonight, above all, I hope that a small piece of Canada will find a home in your hearts, just as it has in ours. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Frankfurt. Looks like quite a trip. Well, in Montreal, the relationship between a shelter for Indigenous women and a child protection agency continues to deteriorate. The shelter is now asking for an inquiry into the agency. Tom Fenario explains. Located in the northernmost reaches of Quebec is the Inuit territory of Nunavik, a unique place where Inuit culture is strong. But like many remote regions, they lack for services. Flying over a thousand kilometers to Montreal is often the only option for help. But allegations are they are not getting what they need from a youth agency there. Can we talk about the, uh, you know, children that are not allowed to talk to their parents in front of a social worker in Inuktitut? Can we talk about the social workers that have these derogatory comments that they talk to our workers about Indigenous people? Can we talk about these issues first? Because that's a problem. Nagusa is the executive director of the Native Women's Shelter of Montreal. She says after eight years of trying, she is done trying to talk to the youth protection agency that works with Indigenous children in Canada's second largest city. What's most unfortunate is that if you don't actually put a request in to the Human Rights Commission, that nothing gets resolved, nothing happens. The shelter has teamed up with the Centre for Research Action on Race Relations, a civil rights advocacy group, to request an inquiry into Batshaw Youth and Family Services. Specifically, they want the Quebec Human Rights Commission to look at the Batshaw's lack of services for Indigenous kids in care, as well as their hiring practices. Currently, there's only one social worker within Batshaw that is Indigenous. But Batshaw says they've been trying for over a year. At the moment, we have two open positions for Indigenous workers, and there have not been any applicants for the positions. How Batshaw serves as Indigenous clientele has been subject to other criticism. Following accusations that Inuit in care were not being allowed to speak in Nuktatut, a Quebec Human Rights Commission investigation concluded that Inuit youth in Montreal were being denied their right to cultural preservation. The commission recommended that the right of Inuit youth to freely speak their mother tongue be reaffirmed and that this right be clearly written into the codes of conduct. Batshaw says that youth are only asked to refrain from speaking in Luktatut under very specific circumstances. We allow the children to speak in their uh, native tongue. Uh, the only time that we would ask them not to is when it's flagged to us that their safety might be at risk. Batshaw did receive a vote of confidence recently from Makovic, the organization that represents Inuit from Quebec. In this press release, Makovic says that discussions are underway to improve the situation for Nunavik youth who are under the care of the center. But the Native Women's Shelter says Batshaw has had more than enough time to address issues that have been raised in multiple studies and reports. They have the solutions because we've given it to them already. And it's just a lack of will or, I don't know, ego. I don't know what it is uh, because it's beyond us. I would disagree that nothing has been done. A lot of things have been implemented. Um, you know, let's not forget we've been in a pandemic for 18 months. The response for the request for inquiry is expected in the coming weeks. Tom Fenario, APTN National News, Montreal. The Prime Minister finally answered the call to visit the site of the Kamloops Residential School, but the trip was not without controversy. That story and more coming up. Welcome back. A long-standing volunteer with the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Centre has been fired. It's over photos he posted to his Facebook page of Nazi memorabilia. Michelle Karlinzig has more on the story and a warning to our viewers. Some of these images may be upsetting. Keith Taylor has been a volunteer patient advocate with the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Centre 
for 12 years. He was let go of that position this week over photos posted to his Facebook page almost a decade ago depicting Nazi flags and a head of Hitler bus. One photo showed three unidentified children in war helmets with a Nazi flag in the background with the caption, training them young. He says he can understand why the photos look offensive, but explains he meant training the kids in war history. It was unfortunate that was in what I call the flag room. Uh, I guess a bad angle, but if you, you look at that picture, uh, the kids are, uh, uh, the one, uh, the one uh, child, these are my um, uh, relatives, are wearing, there's no Nazi stuff except the flag. Taylor said he had plans to open a museum and has a passion for history. My keen interest on history, especially military history, I mean, as a kid, I was always watching war movies and, and drawing tanks and... He says he's not a Nazi and there was no malice or ill intentions behind the photos. The Thunder Bay Hospital said they could not discuss the details of the incident, but in an email to APTN said in part, with thousands of staff and volunteers, it is unrealistic to monitor social media for infractions. However, if a concern is brought forward, human resources would investigate and report back to senior leadership with findings and recommendations. That investigation has concluded and the aforementioned volunteer is no longer affiliated with TBR HSC. Thunder Bay has been under the microscope for racism in Canada, including accusations of racism in the Thunder Bay Health Sciences Centre. Taylor says he understands why the hospital made the decision they did and has since removed most of the photos. He also says he's sorry. To those people, I would apologize. That there's no intent for those people to see those pictures. I mean, eventually they probably would have in a different context, in a more of a museum context and educational context. Uh, you know, those posts were, were made for a narrow group of people that were assisting me, I guess. And I do feel, you know, and I will go back to it, like, you know, I've spent several years uh, trying to do what I could for Indigenous people. And, you know, I'm no hero, but, uh, you know, I can see why people are offended. There's no ifs and buts about that. And I... Michelle Karlenzig, APTN National News, Thunder Bay. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was invited to Kamloops, B.C. earlier this week to meet with the Kamloops Equipment leaders and residential school survivors. 215 unmarked We've graves were found at the site of the former residential school in May. The visit came after he was harshly criticized for not attending time, truth like and reconciliation ceremonies at the site on September 20th, or 30th, sorry, opting like instead for a family vacation in Tofino. Trudeau called his vacation like a mistake. Cookby Roseanne Casimir called for more meaningful way. action towards reconciliation. And days later, there was a call for the Prime Minister's resignation after he said in Kamloops that all residential school documents had been released. As Tina House reports, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation said that claim wasn't true. Earlier this week, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau came to to Kamloops to Sepwepam to apologize and make amends for not visiting the First Nation on the first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation on September the 30th but rather at a beach vacation in Tofino, B.C. I'm sorry I wasn't here on September 30th. It was a mistake. Since the horrific discovery of the 215 children found buried, just steps away from where the PM was speaking, leaders and survivors were waiting to hear what he had to say about the vital documents surrounding residential schools, which they have been calling for for years. We continue to advocate for full unfettered access to student attendance records. We need the capacity to ensure the resources and technical expertise to complete the work of identifying all the Lisque in our care. And when asked about those documents, the Prime Minister had this to say. All the federal records, all the records in possession of the federal government uh, have already been turned over to the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation in Winnipeg. But the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation says they have not received those records. In a statement they said, this is not accurate. At present, 
we are still waiting for Canada to provide the final versions of school narratives and supporting documents. The NCTR has various school narratives on its website, but some are out of date. For other schools, no narrative has ever been provided to the NCTR. Additionally missing are various Library and Archives Canada quality records, and records from provincial governments, most of whom have not yet produced vital statistics, including death certificates for children lost at schools or coroner's reports. At present, we are also still unable to access Indian hospital records, federal health records, and day school records. Okay, Grand Chief Stuart Phillips says he is astounded uh, that he would give an inaccurate statement to leaders and survivors. A man that declared the Indigenous peoples were the most important relationship to the Canadian government, and yet there's been a litany of broken promises empty commitments and meaningless apologies. I think um, if he has a shred of honour left, he should resign forthwith. We reached out to the Prime Minister's office to clarify his comments. His office replied by email, stating, We have provided over four million documents to the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation. To the best of our knowledge, all documents were provided. If that's not the case, we will do everything we can in working with all parties of the IRSSA to make sure the documents are provided. Thank you very much, everyone. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. Meanwhile, an Alberta man is on a quest to find out where his great-grandfather, who was a chief of the Big Stone Cree Nation, was buried. APTN's Chris Stewart has that story. Chief Maxime Beauregard was chief of the Big Stone Cree Nation from 1947 until 1962. He was sick and sent to the Charles Campbell Hospital in Edmonton. The hospital treated mostly indigenous people from the north. The hospital used patients as guinea pigs for experimental treatments and vaccines. Many who went there never went home, including Chief Beauregard, who died in 1963. Travis Glanju Beauregard has been looking for his great-grandfather's resting place. When he had gotten sick, they had sent him to the council and they had never brought him back home. Um, a lot of it was due to the fact that lack of infrastructure, roads, uh, they couldn't um, haul, the, haul the remains uh, back home. So back then I was told that they used to bring uh, it to the closest neighboring reserve at that time, which was Enoch. He found Chief Beauregard's death records in the Alberta archives, narrowing down where to look. Where I found his death records, it said the old Winterburn Cemetery. And so I started looking into the research, and there was two possible locations. And one was here in Enoch, and the other one is in St. Albert. And so at this point in time, I've been doing my research. Um, I have, you know, strong evidence and, you know, strong doubt to believe that he is, could possibly be here. This day, he is walking around a large path of land, which appear to be on the Enoch Cree Nation Reserve, close to the border of Edmonton, and by the River Cree Resort and Casino, owned by Enoch. The field looks mostly empty. A few markers are here. Not many. Two markers of children who died at three years of age. There could be many unmarked graves. A lot of these people, uh, patients, um, had never went home. So just like many families that have been affected, just like myself, a lot of us are looking for closure, uh, looking for a lot of answers. Uh, my grandfather died back in 1962. Uh, we are now in 2021. So there's uh, a lot of wounds and a lot of healing uh, from a lot of past trauma and hurt. Travis Gladue Beauregard wants the grounds scanned with ground penetrating radar to see how many people are resting here. He says he has been unable to find the record of those who have been buried here. If they don't have the names of the people here, we'll at least try to have an idea of where the plots are, put something there, at least to honor them. Um, you know, to some of these people, you know, we don't know if they got a traditional burial. We don't know if they got a Christian burial for that matter. Enoch Cree Nation Communications told APTN that there were more markers on the grounds, but they were taken down due to them becoming worn down over time. They said they would attempt to find information on the names of those buried here. They have not gotten back to APTN before airtime. 
Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Enoch Cree Nation. Time for another quick break, but coming up, a story about Ojibwe spirit horses. Stick around. Welcome back. An Indigenous organization has taken over a farm in Nepean, Ontario, west of Ottawa. As APTN's Fraser Needham reports, the enterprise is a horse of a different colour. The Mataoki farm sits on traditional Algonquin land south and west of downtown Ottawa. Mataoki means share the land in Algonquin. It was taken over by the organization Indigenous Experiences earlier this month. Trina Mather Samard says it's all about the connection to the land. But we did really want to find a location that allowed us to have more of that connection to the land uh, and really be able to share our culture and build our organization in new ways. Um, so we started kind of looking at farm properties and came across this uh, was the former uh, Lone Star Ranch here in Ottawa. The farm's first major event is the Tagwagi or Autumn Festival which got underway recently. We also have a celebration stage. We are doing the Thanksgiving Address, the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving Address. Uh, we're also doing a Three Sisters Corn Beans and Squash uh, play along with a powwow dance performance. So again, you know, celebrating some of those harvest activities. One of the highlights of the festival are the Ojibwe spirit horses. They're native to North America and existed on the continent prior to colonization. They were close to extinction in the late 1970s. Rhonda Snow is an Ontario artist. She and a handful of others made it a lifelong passion to revive the breed. And when I was a young girl, I sat around the staircases of the loggers' houses and listening to the stories of the little ponies and I was so shy I just hid there waiting for my girlfriend to come out and play. And I heard about these little tiny horses that used to live in the woods and in the bush and I thought someday I'm going to find them. Snow would eventually end up owning her own herd of spirit horses and at one point had as many as 60. She says the horses managed to survive post-colonial extinction making them a symbol of Indigenous resilience. Just like the Indigenous people's cultures were stripped from them, the native ponies, their ways of being with their families and herds were stripped from them also. And they, just because they're little, doesn't mean they're mighty. It's the littlest things in nature that are sometimes the most important that get stepped on. And these little ponies did, and so did the culture of the people, the language. The fall festival wraps up this coming weekend. Mather Samard says plans are already in the works to hold a winter festival in early December. I'm Fraser Needham for APTN News, Ottawa. Well, that is all the time we have for your APTN National News this weekend. For news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.